so much for staying with a full house like this so late on a um, Tuesday afternoon. I'm going to try and rattle, um, take you um, through where I've, uh, where I've come from. What we're trying to do now with um, some of the mobile technologies that have been discussed uh, this afternoon, and then if I can really squeeze in a little bit of the, the, the back end, I want to take you down to Haiti and see, um, and just uh, share with you a little bit of um, some of the magic we're creating down there as well. Okay, so um, I'm going to go off the iPad mini, so unfortunately I'm, um, I'm anchored off the, uh, the podium here, but I'll fly. I'm an interventional radiologist. I, um, I operate on patients while they're awake under local anaesthetic. I do mainly deep tissue um, biopsy into the lung and the liver and uh, kidneys and whatever other cavity um, we get our hands on. Um, and it's a fantastic field that marries um, anatomy with all the technology. And it's also allowed me to have really quite a, um, a fantastic life. And I'll try and walk you through some of that. I um, grew up in a little place called the Hunter Valley in um, New South Wales. My old man was a country GP. He had uh, virtually no technology other than the old um, stethoscope and a rusty old bag and a truck. We had eight kids and our job was to basically keep Dad awake. Mum would put us in the truck and after we made our first old commuter, we could go off um, with him on the uh, rounds to all the different hospitals around the Hunter Valley. Um, and outside of that, we had no technology. We had really old landline telephones. We had to try and catch him at the various hospitals as he worked his way around the valley. And um, he once said to me, look, Johnny, don't you ever even think about doing medicine? Um, you just haven't got the personality for it and uh, they'll, um, they'll crush you. And I think to some degree he was probably right, but um, I felt even then that um, healthcare really did need to disrupt him. And um, if, uh, if I could share with him some of my journey over the last 10 years since unfortunately he's moved on, he'd be, I think, fairly blown away with what we have uh, at our uh, fingertips today. Listen, I went off and I trained at these wonderful centres around the world in London and up in Cambridge and uh, over in Stanford in California. And um, long story short, my visa got trapped and I ended up um, back in the bush um, doing a locum high, high up in regional, rural, remote Western Australia. And um, my, my job was basically to do a locum for a little guy called um, Paul Barber Riley, a little Irish um, radiologist, great little guy, tiny little fella, long, long beard, long, thing, filthy fingernails, he used to roll his own cigarettes. He played a fantastic fiddle. He was a really dirty little guy to look at, but he was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful bloke. And he um, created some magic up there in the bush, but he'd not had a break for about 10 years. And the word got around that I was trapped in my visa, and he rang me and he said, Johnny, would you like to come up to the locum? So I flew up into Cyclone Cranky Frankie, and um, the very next day, um, I came in on the, uh, um, on the Rolf Line Doctor, they um, dropped me off at uh, Fitzroy Crossing and myself and Albie, an Aboriginal driver, we hopped in the back of an old um, Toyota truck where they mounted an old um, Aloper ultrasound machine and said, so, your job is to go off and do the ultrasounds on the, um, on the ladies in this Aboriginal community about 200 kilometres directly um, east of Fitzroy. And this was my first five patients. I up and asked people, you know, what have they got in common? My little, beautiful little um, child and my 11 year old daughter said, Daddy, they all go to the same hairdresser. But um, they're, they're, actually, they're all all, um, they're all Aboriginal, as you can tell. They're all female, and they're all diabetic, and they're all pregnant, and sadly, uh, and they're all related. They're all actually from the same family. We've got grandma, we've got her daughter, and their three little ones. And unfortunately, we we don't we haven't got enough dads to match those, and that's not some of the sadness of the problems we have up there. But my job that particular day it was the 11th of the 11th, 1995, so 18 years ago, yesterday, I think. Um, we were up there in. Uh, in 48 degrees Celsius doing um, 48 ultrasounds out of the back of this old truck. And my job was to try and identify which mums had big bubs. And the big babies are, um, are babies of diabetic mums. They um, hang on to the sugar, the sugar goes across the placenta. The babies suck it up, they're not diabetic themselves, but they become so big that when mum goes to deliver the little fella through the normal birth canal, get stuck. And then we end up losing both mum and the little bub. And um, it's still, to this day, the um, biggest cause of death of Aboriginal women of childbearing age is death during that stage of delivery. So my job was basically to, to get the mums, get them on the back of the truck, try and fill up their bladders um, with a 60-60-hour drum of water that we took, and, um, and then try and get an ultrasound on them. We had an old Hessian uh, bag um, that we bring across the back of the tray back, um, and I, the mum wouldn't look at me, she's a pure blood Aboriginal. I said we had to have an elder of the clan, and, and even she wouldn't look at me, but she would at least talk to me. And um, we'd scan away. Normally, as anyone has had an ultrasound, we put jelly on the belly. Well, I didn't need to that day because there was so much sweat just coming off my arm. And the, and the heat was unbelievable. And the stench was phenomenal. And that was me. I absolutely, I was rank that day. Um, but it was one of those really, really, really wonderful days. And um, until I got to um, my 38th month, 
called this little this little one here. Now on your um, left is the, the perfect little profile of a little bub. One on your right is not. That's what we call a hybridiform molar pregnancy. It's a pregnancy that has all the natural ingredients of becoming a beautiful little bub, but it doesn't. It gets really, really intertwined in these various gestational layers, turning into this highly vascular mass, and this massive of tissue has this ability to spread out and um, spread throughout the body, and unfortunately, mum can die from hemorrhage when these little bits of placental tissue and gestational tissue implant in various other organs. So it was a catastrophe for me. You meant to see one in your lifetime, and here I was in the middle of absolutely nowhere with Albie, and um, I really didn't know what to do. Um, but in those days, I knew that this wasn't right, um, and if it, in those days, the only solution that we had was, if in doubt, fly it out. And the Royal Flying Doctor is a fantastic um, Australian icon. It's not for profit, um, and we will fly out for various retrievals, of which around about 12% of our retrievals are for obstetric crisis, and this was an obstetric crisis. I had an old sat phone, an old 300 second sat phone, like an old brick with a huge antenna, and we, uh, we were able to ring the RFDS and give the coordinates of where we were, and then the, um, the plane would come and pick us up. And um, it was that particular day, um, the 11th of 11th of 95, that I just thought, gee, I've been blessed, and I've trained in the centres of excellence around the world, and yet here in the middle of absolutely nowhere, in the red dirt of Western Australia, there's this unbelievable dichotomy where patients just don't have access to the sort of care and, um, and uh, technology that I've become used to during my lesson training. And so um, there was this, this, this gap, and I've watched it over the last um, 10, 15 years, where patients really are beginning to step up and take ownership over their own, uh, their own wellness. They want to be the curators and the collators of their own well-being. But as a doctor in this traditional system that we've grown up on, we resist that and we try and hold on to all of the, um, the data and we try and hold the whole control around the health ecosystem. And I want to share with you now about how we went about trying to disrupt that. So that night, I just felt that there's something wrong with the way we deliver care. And so um, I thought, what if we could link these small little fragmented communities distributed over this huge geographical area of Western Australia, some 650,000 um, um, people are out there, a massive, massive two and a half million kilometres, four times the size of Texas to put the Americans in their place. So she was a big old paddock, Western Australia, still is, and these tiny fragmented communities just weren't getting the care they needed. And so I figured, what if, what if? we can build, I didn't know what to call it at the time, but effectively a telemedicine solution. And how would I go about doing that? I had absolutely no training in technology, and to this day I still have it, um, which probably speaks for a lot. But um, we went about, I put some ads up into all of the Australian capital pa um, city papers, up into Asia, for expressions of interest into, um, into data transfer. And I wanted to go away from the traditional way of using paper and film and putting them up on the old viewing box, try and start spinning these images, starting with ultrasound, around these simple little 3K telephone um, copper wires that were around Western Australia, just a normal telephone. So I had to go mobile, I couldn't be able to bring these patients down to the city where I operated, so I basically um, went off and um, started um, visiting Harvey Colding on the British Town Management of Margaret River, and I'd sleep literally in the back of the station wagon, which you can see there. Um, Toshiba had a little mobile ultrasound machine with the very first one of its type on the market. They wanted to sell it to me for about 70 grand. We settled eventually on 28,000. They wanted me to pay in 30 days. I said, asked for 90, we settled on 60. Medicare paid me in 50 days. I had 10 days cash flow positivity and we've never looked back. And so that's how we actually grew this great little practice, which then grew into um, an international uh, enterprise and international practice. So Western Australia, as I said, it's a big old footprint, and bit by bit by bit by bit, those little green dots, we started uh, offering services from them. And then across into um, Queensland and uh, and various other places in remote um, territories in in Australia. Then along came this massive, massive um, wave of um, corporatisation where radiologists, it's, it's, it's actually, um, it's quite a, it's, it's a well-paid profession, and then when you aggregate a whole lot of radiologists into these practices, those practices themselves were incredibly, um, what do you call it, like very, very profitable enterprises. And so the corporates came in and started buying up these private radiology practices and aggregating them into publicly listed companies. Now, no one was worrying about me at that stage, and they, were, they sort of kind of liked helping me in any way they could, um, but they really weren't interested in the bush, and they weren't interested in any of the regional areas of Australia, they just wanted the big cities, and then they were going to move on to another country. Um, but bit by bit by bit, we became bigger, and then they started to stomp me out, and they were opening literally in the, the towns that I was in. Um, I don't 
to understand why they did it, because uh, we were at that stage probably um, the practice was too big to buy, and um, and it was easy for us to for them just to sort of close me down. And so what I thought was that why don't I just link up all the people around the world that had helped me build this um, this little practice called Image in the South in Western Australia, all of the centres of excellence where I sent these um, images across over the course of the preceding years for. for um, second opinions, what about if we link all of those people into one practice and we call it global diagnostics? And, um, and so we did. And long story short, um, we basically take now x-rays, ultrasounds, CAT scans, MRI, PET scans, and we spin them around the clock around the world to a portal of radiologists who are awake and alert using high resolution monitors and voice activated dictation to basically look at these images, no matter what they might be, transcribe them, and then using voice activated dictation and get that onto a uh, report and put the key images in and then send it back on the referring doctor's desktop or to their mobile device. And we do that within minutes rather than hours or days or weeks or even in, in months as it was in the NHS at that time. So that's pretty well what we do. And our real advantage, I say, look, it, our real advantage was that we weren't afraid to embrace this technology. I had no idea what I was doing. Absolutely no idea that I was doing. But I just felt I was so far down the road I couldn't turn around. And to think that we control the technology is an absolute lie. The technology absolutely flogged me for the guts of 10 years before I think bit by bit by bit we got on top of it. But I knew that one day we would. And um, the, I suppose the most powerful metric of what we've done down there with Global in, in Australia is that we've reduced those obstetric retrieval sounds that the Royal Flying Doctor used to do. If in doubt, fly it out. Well, we've taken the doubt out of that by providing mobile solutions at point of care in regional and remote areas where there was never any care before. And so the Royal Flying Doctor doesn't have to do the, um, the number of retrievals that it used to do 15 years ago. And what started out as just a pretty crazy sort of a concept of how we could link up these centres of excellence around the world and these, the best minds at any time of the world um, any type of disease process, whether it's a little lady from Manjama in southwest corner of Western Australia with a squamous cell carcinoma in the lateral wall of the nose, I can send those images to the top draw um, opinion of the guy in Stanford or wherever else it might be around the world for that particular type of esoteric disease. And I thought that in itself, from a clinical point of view, was an absolute thrill. So we've actually built this enterprise from a bunch of people that to this day, half of them have never ever met each other other than on Skype. And we've traded this um, truly global network. Dashboard is um, pretty well, it's 24-7 as I said, moved from Australia by, by invitation to the United Kingdom just 12 years ago and by invitation into Ireland about five years ago. Some of you may have experienced global diagnostics in little places called um, the VHI Swift Clinics where you'll see the diagnostics rapidly done and turned around and reported within minutes as I said. We also, um, we service the Hermitage and Arco and Ennis Hospital and various other hospitals now um, around Ireland and just over 100 sites now um, around the world. But my real interest was you know, who are the drivers of healthcare? And for so long, we think we are, you know, with the, the doctors in their white coats. But, you know, we're not. And we haven't been for some time. This guy obviously thinks he is. But um, it's never, it's been the payers to some degree. But now, I think it's, it's the patient. And the patient is going to be the driver of the way we go forward with healthcare. And this, and around about this time last year, I think it was there, mate, I had a bit of a dilemma on, on my own. Uh, in that um, you get to a point where you grow a practice and it was always a practice to us, but you know, suddenly you, you've got 400 staff and you're 24 seven around, you know, three, four, five um, international markets. And um, it gets to a point where maybe, just maybe the entrepreneurial um, founder is not actually um, the person to go on and really scale this and really capture the, the magic value that we already created down the track. And so that was a huge personal dilemma for me. And the other thing that was really, really digging into me was that I just felt like there was unfinished business to do. I just felt that we really, really had to go in and disrupt healthcare. Because whilst we would, we'd started off in the bush, we're getting sucked back into hospitals. And I wanted to stop <coughs> patients coming to hospitals. So I decided to, um, to what you guys would call exit the practice. Uh, in um, December of last year, and we, we sold the practice through a uh, management buyout to a um, private equity group, and they're going forward um, with my partner, Centric Health, and going to do some pretty wonderful things. But as I said, I'm not necessarily the scale guy, and um, I'm more of a disruptor. So what next for, um, for, for JW? Listen, only just over an hour ago, I was standing pretty well in exactly that same position um, with, uh, with a little old lady got another diagnosed seven years ago with um, uh, left breast cancer, and has been clear to follow up, and then just literally yesterday presented with a cough. And um, she's got uh, we think metastatic disease in the uh, right lung. We also did a CAT scan on her today, and she's got a, a tummy full of um, what I think is metastatic fluid, and, and, and the tumour is now beginning to eat into the fat around the bowel. And so I was standing literally there, just just over an hour ago, mate. So I'm sorry for being late. And, and uh, 
and taking some fluid out. But the great thing about my patients is they're all awake and they all can have a yarn with me. You can see Pete here. So Pete, I'm taking some fluid out of his lung there and often I'll get um, patients to scrub up that right hand so they can get in and give me a hand. A lot of people like being interactive. That's not for everyone, but um, you'll be surprised. <laughs> you better get a chance to give it a go. Anyway, so I want to keep doing the, um, the fun stuff. But where is the future? And the future really is around mobile connected personalised healthcare. And um, I'm, I'm going to be banging on the cages in a few care hospitals to tell them that their existence is under real, real threat. Now, look, this is a healthcare ecosystem. Whenever I open up these two pages, I can hear everyone's anus sphincter in the room just snap closed because it's so complex and it's chaotic. But in fact, um, it is a, a really bizarre ecosystem. It is out there, including all of the payers and the, and the medical schools and the hospitals and what have you. But where in all of that is the patient? And that's the real um, concern for me. So what I've done is I've broken out and set up a thing called Health Founders, which is essentially just a foundry where we're going to bring really, 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 really clever, bright, young, free thinkers together and using some exponential technologies to try and go out and have a real bang of healthcare and, um, and disrupt it as best we can. So in terms of um, healthcare, um, the big problem is, sorry guys, we're limited here, here by the, the mini, is that it's a legacy system we've grown up with for years and years and years. It's a hospital-based system, and it's a doctor-centric focus. There I was walking around one of these white coats, you know, and it's just not right. And you might say, well, what, well what's wrong with it? It works. Well, it does work, but it, it's buckled and it's bent. It's not completely broken and shattered, and we don't want that to happen we need a really, really good acute care hospital for what it's, what it's needed for. But at the moment, it's unsustainable. We know it's unscalable, it's unsafe, it's highly, highly inefficient. And I happen to work with Hermitage, which is a very, very efficient hospital, but there are still deep inefficiencies in virtually everything we do. And it's ineffective and incredibly costly in terms of people, time, and dollars. And so you might ask, well then, Johnny, what's the solution to that? Well, part of the solution is getting people out of hospital, stop them even coming in the front door by keeping them well in the community and trying to promote health and wellness within the community. And you ask, well, Jesus, how do you, how do, you do that? Well, well, part of it is extending the current primary care model, which to some degree still focuses around the GP and we're blessed by having um, really bright community nurses, dentists, pharmacies and um, physiotherapy. But where, where, where is the patient in all of this? And in my experience, the patient is usually driving around, trying to find a car park, usually with the kids in the, in the car and screaming, and, um, and taking a ticket to wait in line, okay? So is that really the most effective model that we think we can create for a way going forward? And I don't think it is, all right? We really, really, really now need to engage, embrace, enable, and empower, and educate patients in a non-patronising way, but really give them entitlement to the way we deliver healthcare with them, for them, okay? And so, we can do that, I believe, deeply in their own home. And now with enabling technologies, there's absolutely no reason for us not to be delivering somewhere between 30, 40, up to 50% of care can actually be delivered within the home, all right? So how might we do that? We just go mobile, we go digital, we go connected, and we make it very, very, very personalised. The electronic health records at the moment are in the belly of the hospital or in the local GP practice. You know, <coughs> the family has no visibility on their own chronological history, um, particularly the three or four kids, you don't know which one's allergic to um, penicillin, you don't know which one's having immunisation at two o'clock in the morning when everyone's tearing around. It can be pretty tough. So we think that the very first step is to basically start um, empowering the patient. Now that's a big, big realignment within the healthcare ecosystem, particularly when the payers are very, very happy with the way it works at the moment. Now, we're going to try and redesign the healthcare system at Health Founders, and I want to share with you one of my observations that I've had over the years in that 92% of the patients that I operate on are actually accompanied, and it didn't fail me again today, accompanied by the female. And the female is the real gatekeeper, the shepherd, the protector. We call her the Jinga. Jinga was the African warrior queen. She's the great disruptor of Africa. She saw off the British. And so um, we call ourselves um, Jinga Life. Um, which is going to be our first offering. And the problem with the, um, in any relationship is that, particularly in, in partnerships, is that there are a hell of a lot of balls in the air. Particularly when the kids come around and then suddenly you've got the, um, the homework, you've got the sport, you've got the holidays, you've got the groceries, you've got everything else. But that health ball tends to be, in, in our experience, in both first world and almost 100% in third world, juggled by the female, the female curator of the family. So. Do we really operate a truly patient-centric service? At the moment, we don't. And the problem when Jinga comes into our healthcare system, we talk over her, we talk around her, we talk about supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis. You know, that's just the rotator cuff. 
and you know, we, we, we make a waiting line and she feels like she's on this conveyor belt of care and can never get off that. So it is a patient-centric um, model and we want to disrupt that. So how would we do that? By placing her absolutely at the centre of her own ecosystem, all the way from conception all the way through to that really, really important end of life phase through to, um, to the grave. And what we want to do is design this platform with the gender in mind. And our first offering is a jingle, uh, digital life tree. It's basically a freemium electronic health record in the shape of a tree where every single member of the family will have a branch on the tree. We're gonna put a lot of social into that as well. And then we've got, we realise that she will need to connect through to the um, GPs and acute care hospitals. And we've got a, um, an application, a, a 30 second video tool that allow that to do it. So there you see the analogy of the tree. Now with the wearable sensors, with the, um, the wrists, the earrings, we can now get blood sugar level, we can get um, blood gases, we can get renal function, we can get respiratory rate, blood pressure, etc. All from non-invasive wearable sensors. We can then through low-energy Bluetooth push that through to various um, platforms, one of which will be the Jingle Life tree, and that can all be visible, um, cloud-based <coughs> and totally secure 24-7 and reviewed in the comfort of, um, of your own home. Um, there's little Angus with all these prenatal scans and his immunisation and all the key milestones which we don't have to recollect ourselves. They're all now collated for us and any physiological metrics of temperature and blood pressure can also be acquired and automatically put onto the system. So that really is a fundamental change in where the Jinga stands in terms of the whole eco healthcare ecosystem. Now, at 2 o'clock in the morning, when you get the kids out of bed, she's got four kids, the little one's got a, um, an upset tummy and is vomiting, and got diarrhoea and fever, no rash or anything like that. She would normally be in KDOC or CareDoc or DDoc or go out and see if Swift Care if they're still open or try and take the um, uh, lucky dip and see how long the wait is at ED. So what we want to do is be able to do away with all of that and really empower the jingle. Um, we use a little 60 second video tool. So this, I'm not sure if this is going to work, but hold your, hold your um, breath, it might. Another one. He's still vomiting. His temperature's still quite high. There isn't a rush. Uh, he doesn't seem to. So this is a little 30 second video. Yeah. So that's not and in that question, time, Mum can get the clinical history through. Three so kids are asleep, okay? And she can come and reach out to a doctor, okay? And she can have a virtual consultation. I'll quickly go through this. That's me again. My, name, my name's John Anderson. Thanks for reaching out about Little Angus. I think you're. I'm having a bit of a tough old time there tonight with him. I understand he's got some vomiting. Um, uh, the temperature's up a little bit, but he's got no diarrhea. Importantly, he's got no um, neck stiffness, he's got no rash, and the tummy is soft, and he's still passing urine, so he's still wetting um, uh, his nappies. So listen, that's all good. What I think is we're dealing with this 24-hour bug that's going around and it's flying around. We need to do two things. We need to keep on top of these fluids, so small fluids regularly. Don't give him a lot too much, because he'll just vomit that back. Small sips regularly. We need to get on top of the temperature. So count pulse suppository in the back passage. We'll be monitoring his um, his vital signs. I can see his temperature is up. So we'll be watching that over the next few hours. All the other vital signs are good. And listen, um, just uh, keep an eye on it. But at the same time, try and get some rest yourself, okay? Uh, we don't want you getting too worn out. We're going to get through this together, all right? So hang in there. We'll talk to you in a few hours. Cheers now. I didn't hear that. Anyway, 58 seconds. Right, but doesn't that, isn't that effective and efficient in terms of use of time? We, we know that the one hasn't got a rash, we know that there isn't any neck sniffers because you're worried about meningitis, but this is going to be a, um, a vomiting bug and we just need to let time heal, alright? So what it's done is simplified the ecosystem and we've empowered mum, educated her in the um, home, 24 hours for everybody she cares for and freed up the natural resources. Listen, there will be times when you've got to come to the hospital, but why don't we start planning the discharge before patients even arrive? And using smart health informatics to do that, we can use Halo um, and various other connectivity devices to make sure that we get the patient where we need um, at the right time. We don't want patients staying in hospitals for long periods of time because we're not a great place to be with communicable diseases and with DVT and bugs and various other administrative and um, prescription errors. So when they leave hospital, we have a real duty of care to ensure that they're well. And now with Obamacare in America, if that patient presents within 30 days with the same set of signs and symptoms for which you would just pay to treat, you penalise up to 50% of that fee and you paid over 25% of the second fee. So how are we going to do this? Well, we use just simple enabling technologies and, this, and half the smarts is in the room here today. We haven't even scratched the surface on what we're going to be able to do and deliver. The real problem is none of, 
no one has really aggregated this into a workflow that's going to bring around significant and very real, tangible, measurable behavioural change. Okay? And that's exactly what, um, what we want to do. We want to come in and look and listen. We want to design, disrupt and transform the way we deliver healthcare. If I can just hold you for two more minutes, I'll, I'll just share with you, if I can, um, a little island which sits off the... Um, Southwest Peninsula of Haiti. It's a little island called um, Ilavash, and on that little island there's a little um, uh, orphanage called the Madame Lavar uh, Orphanage. I don't know if you can read that, um, guys, but the, um, the island metrics are pretty horrific. The medical system is a voodoo system. It's a true, genuine voodoo system. If that little one doesn't get better within seven days, they weren't meant to get better. And so you've got to get the little one along to the voodoo temple. Average life expectancy there is 52 years. Five um, under five mortality of 12% of the 1,000 live births. I mean, it's horrific, and 3.8% of the kids are actually HIV. So it is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful little paradise, hammered with the, um, the natural disaster that occurred down there, but full of unbelievable colour and life. But when you get down there, this amazing dental dilemma where I've never actually had pus come back out from the dental abscess out through the ear. And this is what was happening. I was able to actually literally, without putting it off your dinner tonight, guys, but it literally um, decompress this able tooth abscess back out through the ear. And so a massive de um, dental dilemma, mainly because they're eating sugar cane and they're eating lollies from NGOs and what have you. But a great little guy called Mark Mork has a thing called Oral Eye from Limerick, where he's able to take six inch oral pictures using just the iPhone and then spin those images through to a team of funny enough dentists, just like Global Diagnostics did with radiologists. He sends them to dentists who will then come back to us on the web and tell us, Johnny, it's the left upper uh, third. So I'd get in there with my pliers, and I'd literally pull out the left upper third, and these teeth would just come away in our hands. Quite phenomenal. And you're probably sitting there thinking, yeah, Jesus, Johnny, you're on this little island down off um, Haiti. How'd you manage to do that? Well, I'll get to that in a second, but we did have some enabling technologies in terms of broadband. This little guy there with the sunglasses and the Manchester United hat, he has no legs below his knees. He's become our dental captain down there, and he's an absolute wizard with this little iPhone. So every kid in the orphanage now, we've got a full dental, um, um, chronological history on their uh, on their dentition and we were able to maintain dental hygiene. Well, um, one of the one of the important things down there is that when all of their health records were washed away, we were able to now move them on to an electronic health record. And this isn't about thrusting first world technology on third world countries who aren't ready for it. Although there is a lot of that happening down there. And so we're going to go down and we're just doing this bit by bit by bit, but we put down an electronic health record within the orphanage, which will now service the entire um, island of 16,000 people. And then sometimes, listen guys, you've just got to get out there and have a crack at it. Um, we knew that the, um, the patients weren't going to come to us in our, in our little mock-up clinic that we did there, so we hopped in the boat, and that's Capitano at the back. There you'll see all the Digicel hats, but they're all mad on their Manchester United as well. And I'm going to talk about social media here today, but all we did, we had a megaphone, and all we'd call out was the doctors are coming, the doctors are coming, and in, um, in Creole, and then the patients would start coming out of the jungle and they'd sniff us and have a look around, but they wouldn't really engage. And I said to um, Capitano, I said, what we really need is Facebook. And he looked at me and said, well, you want Facebook, you want Facebook? And I thought he was going to throw me out of the boat. And, he, and I said, mate, I'd love it. And uh, so he gets on and they have text Facebook down there. And he texts his little niece on this little part of the um, island, about two kilometres up. And um, she gets in trouble by the school teacher because on her pop-up, um, latest Ericsson, she gets this little text saying the doctors are coming, the doctors are coming. She tells the um, school teacher, the school teacher sends all the kids back out into the, um, in the village to get their mums and dads and their mums and their dads to come on down to the beach. And here we arrived in this little um, lean-to, which you can see there, and ten minutes later, we were, um, we were on shore, we put some more leaves on the roof there, and we started building a waiting room, and in no time, they just arrived. And they just kept coming and coming and coming for the rest of the day. Now I talk about man's best friend here, you can't see it there, but there's an ankle there that's um, full of pus. It's, um, it, uh, it's, it got infected about two years ago, it's now destroyed all the bone. What you're really going to do is decompress this pus. And I, I run out of local anaesthetic, I run out of everything sterile, but I have a spoon and we have a little fire, so we're able to heat up the back end of the spoon and then basically get that in there and, 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 and relieve the, um, the abscess that had developed in the ankle joint. And as I turned around to clean up the spoon, I looked back and there was the dog just licking away on the, um, on the, um, on the ankle there. So who needs a CAT scan when you've got a dog scan there? 
So, um, look, they just, they just kept coming and it was really one of the um, really, really fulfilling days of my life. Um, 79 adult kids, we did all of the kids in the school that day and it was just truly a magic day. Um, but look, there are some major, major challenges down there. And of course, you know, the big one is with the sanitation and water, it's absolutely um, the filthy. Uh, the law and order is a, is a real concern. Um, just, only, um, just, just over six weeks ago now, we had our translator um, shot dead down there, which, um, which has devastated um, so many of us. Education really is the key, and we were able to paint the school and put in animated um, uh, characters all around the walls. Um, and one of the regular accelerators, which I didn't have when I was in the bush, when I started out all those years ago, was um, Wi-Fi, and um, Digicel whacked up a big old um, 20 meg um, pipe for me, and then after that, there was no holding us back. But the real, real sticky down there was um, playing the sport, and we, we um, have an annual game uh, down there, uh, just outside the orphanage, um, and that's the Black Swan who I marked, who scored, went on and scored two, um, two goals. The real problem we have down there is, uh, I suppose, that so many of us are going to have, and so many enterprises that we've taken on, whether it's benevolent or whether it's for profit or not for profit, is what do we stop doing immediately? And there's stuff down there that we need to stop doing immediately. And there's our stuff that we need to keep doing, and then we need to sit down and really work out what do we need to do going forward, um, and really, really embracing the local Indigenous community to help us um, do that, and do what they need and what they want and what's right for them in this period of time in their culture. And how on earth are we going to prepare for this? Well, maybe a little bit of luck and a little bit of prayer from uh, little angels like Sister Flora, who's down there. But um, in some degree, um, some of our mobile and digital technologies, we've been able to make an impact down there. Guys, thanks so much for squeezing me in on the end.